Hi guys, welcome to episode 38 of the Introducing series. Today we're covering Californian king snakes, which is a fantastic species from Western United States. So we've had a slight change of running order to the way that we produce these videos. Normally we do the natural history and taxonomy at the beginning and the care at the end. We're going to flip that on its head and we're going to start off simple and try and ramp the videos up. We want to engage people, we don't want to turn them off with the scientific side we're not ashamed of the science and certainly you shouldn't be either but you know we do need to maybe bear in mind that we start simple and ramp it up i could well have been guilty of getting carried away with what i find interesting rather than what you guys find interesting um although i make no apology for being a fan of taxonomy and trying to work out oh you're happy there just having a yawn yeah you okay hey um so yeah, we're, we're going to have a slight change to the running order, which, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we've got people engaged and maybe we, we had a comment for maybe doing a series for 14 to 16 year olds. So I don't think that's necessary. I think probably we'll start off by making these videos somewhat easier in the beginning and ramp up towards the end and cover themes that people don't necessarily need to listen to if they don't want to. Uh, California king snakes originate from as we said the western coast of the united states and that includes states of oregon california nevada utah arizona and northwestern mexico because they have such a wide distribution this is an incredibly adaptable snake they come from a range of biomes and habitats and this adaptability is what makes this species incredibly hardy hardiness is one of the chief qualities that we look for in a beginner species uh, the, the ability for us to maybe get things slightly wrong and the snake not become as ill as a result that's a pretty important skill and probably one of the prerequisites california king snakes have huge appetites and this can give them a bit of a troublesome reputation as being maybe a bit bitey which is well it's true but one, snake bites are nothing to worry about, certainly off these little colubrids, they're pinpricks. In fact, getting this girl out who is now totally behaving and doing as she's supposed to, but she bit me coming out of the tank today because they associate absolutely everything that moves in their vivarium with food. So, you know, that's just something that you have to deal with and maybe get used to with dealing with uh, when dealing with king snakes. Um... They're food orientated, they're very switched on for food. So as a result, their territoriality can become a bit of an issue. Um, usually once they're out of the viv, as we can see, she's just a joy, absolute joy to hold. No problems, totally tame, laid back, no issues whatsoever. She's quite happy just mooching around and having a look and seeing what's going on. Everything's good. So, because um, of this territoriality, it's not aggression, they're just daft and they don't engage brain before they just think food as soon as you enter the viv and that's it. Um, care needs to be taken not to overfeed because they're so food orientated and because we're programmed as humans to be feeders, there is a real nasty uh, chance of us creating a obese balloon of a king snake because they're not going to turn food down they will just keep eating and eating and eating if given the opportunity also because they've got little heads uh, we might find that we need to give them uh, smaller prey items for longer than we would do with comparable size snakes such as the rat snakes or corn snakes um, and the reason that they've got this little head is predominantly in the wild, they are snake eaters. So these uh, that's where the, 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 the prefix king comes from. So if we look at king brown snake or king cobra or king snake, these snakes in the wild are known to predominantly eat other snakes, namely the Pacific gopher snake and the Pacific rattlesnake. Interestingly enough, it is resistant to rattlesnake venom, which is ace that they can actually, you know, defeat something as potent as and virulent as a rattlesnake, you know, and, and consume it as part of their natural diet. And, you know, we're not talking about them taking little tiddler rattlesnakes, you know, of almost comparable size to themselves. It's amazing that they get them down. It really is. Um, because these animals have been bred for so long in captivity, 30 or 40 years, and obviously the subsequent generations, I mean, that's probably on par with corn snakes. 
and probably one of our most longest standing captive bred species to work with within the hobby, a huge range of colour forms and pattern mutations exist, including banded, striped, desert, coastal, 50-50, dot dash, banana, albino, lavender and so many more. Um, California king snakes are a moderate sized snake, they're going to approach around 4 feet in length. Some animals may only reach 36 inch, others might carry on up to 5 feet, although you know, potentially that will be as a cause of uh, overbreed, over feeding, sorry. Um, you know, you can get them to five feet, but they, they're not going to thank you for it. And they're certainly not going to live as long as if you'd have grown them on slowly. Uh, but yes, they, they will grow and they will get quite chunky as well. But this animal's a good size and nice and lean and it's not been overfed, which is what we want. Um, the minimum adult size for your vivarium that you would want to choose would be around 90 by 45 by 45 centimetres or in old money a 36, 18, 18. The hot end wants to be around 30 degrees Celsius with the opportunity to cool right down and move away from the hot spot. So down to about 23, 24 degrees Celsius. Hide should be provided along the length of the, uh, the, the vivarium so that they can pick where they feel safe but also the right temperature and then they can move between the ends to control their body temperature this is thermoregulation this is one of the most basic tenets of uh, snake care whatever heat source you choose whether that be a heat pad a spot bulb a ceramic bulb a deep heat projector you must have a thermostat coupled to it to control the temperatures probably most naturalistic of your choices is going to be your ceramic bulb or your deep heat projector where we would try and heat a flag that's beneath the heater and the animals would naturally warm upon these surfaces um, so their type locality is given as fresno california uh, and weather data for the region is the hot season is june to september 33 to 37 degrees celsius which is pretty hot uh, to be fair and then 17 to 20 degrees uh, 17 to 20 degrees celsius nighttime low Cold season, November to February 13 to 19 degrees Celsius with a three to seven degree nighttime low. Wet season is November, uh, sorry, is December to March, 17 to 26 millimeters per month. Dry season, June to September, one, uh, zero to 0 0.2 uh, millimeters per month. So pretty dry, quite a, a, a uh, protracted drought season. Another locality that we can choose for maybe the more coastal regions would be Los Angeles, which is further to the south. Um, and it's slightly less extreme in its daytime values, probably more representative of what this species would have, which is a hot season of July to September, 28 to 29 degrees Celsius, a nighttime low of 18 Celsius, cold season, uh, December to February, 20 Celsius during the day, nine to 10 Celsius at night, wet season, December to March, 13 to 30, 14 to 36 millimeters per month, a dry season, May to September, 0 to 0 0.3 millimetres per month. So we're still talking about a protracted dry season and a real sort of drought element to their year. Traditionally, a season or a brumation would have been provided to induce fertile breeding from the Californian kings. Subsequent generations of captive breeding seem to have somewhat removed this need, although I would still be tempted to give a overall reduction in temperatures both day and night and also a marked change to photo period as well and um, as circadian rhythm seems to inf um, affect breeding activity as much as the temperature changes as well um, obviously animals should be maintained separately you introduce them for breeding please make sure they are well fed prior to introduction owing to the cannibalism although breeding can be somewhat physical with males gripping the nape of a female's neck or the top of her head whilst he breeds that this is normal breeding behavior assuming all goes well and we still have two animals at the end of the breeding trials 12 to 20 eggs will be deposited 7 to 14 days after a pre-egg laying shed these can be incubated at 28 degrees celsius for approximately 55 to 65 days babies rarely have issues in being raised and they establish well on defrosted pinky mice First described in 1835 by, I'm going to try and say this, Henry Marie Ducrete de Blainville, a French herpetologist and zoologist, a man credited with inventing the term paleontology. He was honoured in a species name of a North American horny toad lizard called Phrynosoma blainvillii. 
Taxonomic revisions were numerous, regular, and a pain in the ass. So after the original description, uh, they were then re-described as Ophibolus boyli in 1853 by Baird and Girard, Coronella californiae in 1854 by Dumeril, Bibron and Dumeril. So Coronella actually puts them in the smooth snake genus, which is, it's interesting. I mean, these are a smooth snake, so I suppose I can see the connection, but Coronella up until that point was a European uh, genus. Then Lampropeltus boyli. So I'm assuming that there must have been some sort of dedication with boyli and maybe uh I, I you know it was in reference to somebody else and that was in 1861 by edward drinker cope then back into coronella getulus various uh, coronella getulus variety californica uh, in 1865 by jan so this is the first time we've seen getulus used which is a name used for a lot of the american kings the either getulus or getula complex and on and on and on and it flip-flops backwards and forwards and I'd be here all day if I had to cover it all. So we skip forward to 1980 to Lampropeltis getulus californiae which was proposed by Sufer and Jouch at which point this is where it spent a fair amount of time and for the most part in the hobby that's how it was known or is still known maybe variants of. Then it was changed to Lampropeltis californiae in 2009 by Pyron and Burbrink who also incidentally decided that the much coveted Mexican black king snake, Lampropeltis getula nigritus, uh, is actually synonymous with this species, Lampropeltis californiae. Argue about that one amongst yourselves. So uh, then back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and on it went uh, between Getula californiae and it being part of the American king snake complex with Getula getula eastern chain king being the nominate form and then flip-flopping to Lampropeltis californiae and this being a species of its own or a species proper with no subspecies described. The issue is anything but resolved and this will trundle on for years and years to come. Every five minutes it changes or it gets reviewed. So it's a pain in the backside. So whilst although we're accepting that its own species uh, for the time being, uh, you know, it's also interesting that there is potentially a Europe-wide ban on the Californian king snakes being proposed in whatever paper form it is currently in Brussels. And if this is by itself, it only affects this. Whereas if it was part of the Getula complex, it would affect everything since it's the species listed, not the subspecies. So at which point it would outlaw the whole group. So hmm, a bit convenient and uh, does make you wonder. Uh, but yeah, I, it will continue flipping backwards and forwards. If you see it listed as Lampropeltis Getula californiae, or if you see it listed as Lampropeltis californiae, just accept both as right. It's easier than trying to get pernickety because in five minutes another paper will get published that tells you it's the, something different again. So definitives and uh, permanent solutions we're not going to find. It's always going to be the case. Um, so yeah, a bit, bit of a nightmare. All in all, an excellent species to keep. If it kept uh, handled regularly from early age, they are totally tame and fantastic. If you know you can keep them well fed, but well socialized is probably more important. And the more well socialized, the better. This animal came in relatively recently, and like I've said, the first thing it did in, upon me entering the vivarium, I touched it was dinner. Upon realizing, actually, it's only chance to do a video. She's now soft. There's no aggression, no striking, no nothing. She's completely relaxed. So this is a territory thing, not a temperament thing, which is something totally different. So as long as we bear that in mind and take maybe a bit of extra care removing the vivarium, these will make a fabulous pet. They're available in a huge range of colors and definitely one that I would recommend to the beginner. So I hope that was better. I hope people enjoyed the, the running order of that video slightly more. Um, and we'll we'll see you again soon with another video from Paul and Chaz at Snakes and Adders. Peace.